but we're here to show support for your students and colleagues. One of the strengths of MIRS is the opportunity to grow connections and collaborations across the II, and your participation in events like this are a significant part of how we accomplish this. So today, we have four exceptional students who are eager to share their research and educational journeys. But first, I would just like to go over a few housekeeping points. Please note that this event is being recorded and will be shared via the International Institute's YouTube page. I ask that attendees keep your microphones muted throughout today's program to minimize any disruptions for our presenters. After each speaker, we'll have time for you to ask questions. Feel free to write your question in the chat throughout the presentation and we'll address them all at once. Or if you prefer, once we start the Q&A, I'll invite you to use the raise hand feature and we'll call on people to ask your question directly to the presenter. And with that, I think we're ready to move to the main event, which is our student speakers. Any questions or concerns before I start our introductions? Okay. Terrific. Okay, so our first speaker this afternoon is Amanda Hardy. Amanda is pursuing a dual master's degree in MIRS, Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies specialization, and in the School of Information. Her research centers on social media and disinformation. Currently in her third year, Amanda will graduate in April and intends to pursue a career in public service with the federal government, having been awarded a Presidential Management Fellowship for 2022. Yet another very accomplished student, she additionally received FLAS fellowships for both Russian and Ukrainian, critical language scholarships for Russian, and was a 2021 Boren Fellow for Ukrainian. So please join me in welcoming Amanda for her talk, Russian Vaccine Hesitancy, What Social Media Can Tell Us. Amanda? All right. Um, yeah, so I'm going to be discussing um, vaccine hesitancy among Russian speakers. Um, next slide. Cool. So to give a little bit of preface on the problem, um, communities where Russian is widely spoken tend to have low rates of confidence in vaccine safety and effectiveness, um, especially as compared to the rest of the world. Um, those numbers are from uh, Gallup. Um, this translates to low vaccination rates for COVID-19 and for other diseases, and this impacts both childhood and adult vaccination. Um, so the graph on the right is just um, a comparison of COVID-19 vaccination rates across countries. Um, the UAE is in there because they're the gold standard, they're close to 100%. Um, Europe hovers around 70%. Um, and then the other countries are post-Soviet countries that, um, can, that have a large number of Russian speakers. Um, so even though Russia was one of the first country, was the first country to register COVID vaccine, um, and countries like Kazakhstan also have their own vaccines, people um, are not willing to um, are not willing to get them. Um, in addition to COVID-19, there have been serious measles outbreaks and even polio cases in countries like Ukraine as well. So it's a pretty serious issue. Um, next slide. Um, so this study seeks to um, supplement previous social science research on this issue by analyzing social media data from the social network VK. Um, this is the largest um, Russian social media site with around 66 million active users. Um, and I use the natural language processing tools and um, qualitative thematic analysis to extract some information on how people are talking about vaccines among this demographic. Next slide. Um, so the data consists of around 24,000 posts containing um, a vaccine keyword. This data was collected from October to December 2021, as you can see in the graph. Um, this was during the, um, at that time, during what was at that time the highest um, rates of COVID-19 cases in both Russia and Ukraine. Um, the mean length of posts is about 80 words, and um, the conversation is unsurprisingly dominated by COVID-19, given the, the particularly severe state of the pandemic during the data collection period, um, as well as references to the Russian Federation, which is also not surprising given that Russia is the largest Russian-speaking country in the world. Next slide. So the first major theme that I discovered um, among the posts is trust. So about 5% of posts reference the word trust in some capacity and more reference it um, conceptually without using that exact word. Um, additionally, a huge number of posts reference um, Russian, the Russian Federation's governing and healthcare institutions. Um, so on the right, I know this is in Russian, I apologize. I forgot to translate it, but um, the first is TAS. So that's a Russian um, government backed news outlet. The next, um, the next really long word, that's the Russian version of the FDA. Also mentioned um, are, is the Ministry of Health um, and the Russian Senate, as well as other Russian backed news outlets. So this is um, government and trust are both um, major themes in the data set. Uh, next slide. 
And um, using thematic analysis, I discovered that these two are actually heavily intertwined, um, not very independent of each other. Um, so many users posted about how they didn't trust the government and about how that impacted their willingness to get vaccinated. So the first post um, says that, um, the first representative post says that people need to trust the state in order to get vaccinated, but it's not there. And the more the state tries to promote the vaccine, the less people want to get it. Um, the next post uh, talks about how one user's um, colleague wouldn't get the vaccine because, or wouldn't get a domestic vaccine against COVID-19. Um, and then the second two posts um, reflect the idea that um, the government and healthcare institutions that are working to promote the COVID-19 vaccine are primarily interested in profit. Um, and if healthcare is of interest to them, um, it's uh, secondary. Um, right, so there is definitely a lack of trust in the government's ability to procure and administer um, safe vaccines. Um, and people are also concerned about the motivations of people who are trying to promote vaccination in Russian speaking areas. Uh, next slide. Um, and then the second major thing that I discovered was just scientific misunderstanding. Um, so this was a little bit surprising to me because at least in the United States, I feel like I've seen countless um, infographics and news articles about how vaccines work, but it seems that there's still some confusion um, about that among Russian speakers at the minimum. Um, there was a study conducted in 2008 in Washington state among Russian speaking immigrants, and it was found that many um, were concerned about how the vaccine could impact one's immune system. Um, and I found several posts that also um, had that idea. Um, so the first post that um, I have here um, is someone expressing concern about a child's immune system and how a vaccine might affect that. Um, and then the second one says that, you know, experimental vaccines could destroy your immune system. So um, that was a major scientific misunderstanding. Um, the next user um, seems to be communicating the idea that um, a vaccine involves infecting someone with a disease, which um, is obviously not how that works. Um, and then the final user um, compares COVID with other diseases, which was another major thing that people did. They compared it with the flu or other um, milder diseases. And so um, misconceptions about how vaccines works, as well as misconceptions about how severe certain diseases could be, um, also seemed to impact people's willingness to get vaccinated and impact their, um, their thoughts about vaccination in general. Um, next slide. So those were the two major themes. Um, other notes that I thought were interesting and worth reporting were that um, the tone of the conversation is extremely, um, it's very much not positive. Um, so most of the posts were neutral and negative in nature. Um, and I think that it's important to note that neutral and negative don't refer to attitudes about the vaccines themselves. It refers to the words people use, right? So if I were to say, it's really stupid not to get vaccinated, that would be negative because I use words like stupid and not. Um, if I were to say, you know, vaccines save lives and everybody should get them because they'll, you know, help you and your family, that would be positive sentiment. Um, so conversation is not positive. A lot of anger, a lot of fear, it seems, um, in the conversation. Um, additionally, fears are not often addressed by other users. Um, and I'll get into that more later, but people seem to have pretty reasonable concerns. Um, con conspiracy is a problem, um, but it's not the major problem. So I found posts that, you know, said, you know, talked about lizard people and Bill Gates, and, you know, we all hear about, you know, the crazy things that people can come up with, but most of the posts were, you know, concerned about side effects. Um, and uh, next slide. And if we look at the um, collocation of words, so that's um, words that are commonly used along with vaccine, we can see that people's concerns seem to be pretty reasonable, right? So um, on the left-hand side, we see that from the third one up, we see that side effects um, about vaccine side effects um, are a concern. And then on the right-hand side, we see that people are talking about whether or not vaccines protect you, whether or not they're effective. Um, people are afraid that the vaccine is not tested enough, right? Because there's talks about trials and um, the word experimental. Um, so most of these seem to be pretty addressable. Um, next slide. Um, but a lot of the time they're not addressed in a way that is effective. So um, there were a, a number of posts that would address people's concerns very logically speaking, um, right? Like actually, you know, this vaccine has been all through all, has been through all three necessary um, trial stages. Um, and then they would like link an article, but a lot of the posts were actually pretty nasty and rude. So the first post that I have here is um, in response to a user who 
expressed concerns about getting the vaccine herself because her friends had had poor reactions to the vaccine. And instead of explaining how rare those are, or maybe um, linking this person to a study showing how safe the vaccine actually is, um, this person was like, you know, actually you don't have any friends, so I don't know how um, you could you could have friends that had bad reactions to the vaccines, um, insulting this person's intellect. And then the next um, the next post is in response to someone who compared the flu to COVID um, and thought that it would be riskier to get the vaccine than it would be um, to get COVID itself, which is also a scientific misconception. Um, but again, this person doesn't really address that concern. They instead say that you know you don't care about your own health, um, you're brainwashed, you're an anti-vaxxer. Um, so I thought it was interesting to see that the that the conversation was so negative, and then to see posts like this where people express concerns that um, are definitely misconceptions, but aren't conspiracy theories, um, and have them be addressed in this way. Next slide. So the current conclusions that I have um, are that trust and scientific misunderstanding would be a great place to put educational resources. Um, it seems like a lot of concerns are addressable. So there aren't a ton of people who um, really are out there in the deep. You can't have a conversation with them. Um, it seems that most people um, have pretty reasonable concerns about the vaccines, um, something that can be addressed. Um, and then people who express vaccine hesitant sentiment are not always addressed effectively. So they express concerns, but then those concerns aren't really addressed in a way that's helpful for them. Um, and that is everything. Okay, fantastic presentation. And thank you, Amanda, for taking the term lightning seriously and getting through all the uh, so much amazing material in, uh, in, in a short period of time. So we have about five minutes um, on each of these uh, uh, presentations. So Charlie and Tina have put the instructions in if anybody would like to, to ask a question on Amanda's fantastic research project. Ahmad? Hi, Amanda. Um, I had a question. Uh, did you, during your research, did you find like, I guess, political figures using like political polarization, I guess, themes and among the research and comments and stuff like that? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, that's not something that I had time to put in my presentation, but it is something that I noticed. So people refer to naturally um, political leaders and um, leaders in healthcare. So there's somebody called Alexander Ginsberg. He's the uh, head of the Gamalaya Center, which is the creator of the Sputnik V vaccine. And he was referenced quite a bit and people did not seem to care for him very much. Um, people also discussed you know, Putin and national leaders. Um, one thing that was interesting was that um, local government was referenced a lot because um, in Russia, at least much of the pandemic response has been put to like the local, um, the equivalent of the state level. Um, so there was a lot of discussion about that, but when people talked about government figures in particular, um, they were mostly talking about vaccine regulation. So vaccine passports, um, different laws related to COVID, which is something that I talk about in my paper, um, but because it's not explicitly linked to trust in vaccines, it's more like what is the role of the government in dealing with the pandemic? Um, I wasn't able to address that, but yes, there was a lot of political discussion as well. Thank you. Terrific, great question, Ahmad. Uh, Mara? Hi, I'm curious on how you came to this topic, especially because it, it pretty much came out of nowhere in like early, in like what, early 2020, obviously late 2019. And that, if I'm doing the math right, that was like your first year in college. So like, what made you choose this topic and like, yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so there are two reasons. One is I um, did a research project my senior year. I was actually majored in international studies here at Michigan as well. Um, and I did a project my senior year um, in a public health class on super low vaccination rates in Ukraine. Um, because in 2018, they had a severe measles outbreak um, with about, I think it was 56,000 cases. And for comparison, uh, the United States also had an outbreak that made national news around that time. It was 300 cases. Um, so it was pretty severe, and um, I was became interested in that topic then. Um, I think that, um, you know, obviously the pandemic influenced why I decided to pursue it further. Um, but additionally, I am an information science student um, as well as a Russian studies student. Um, and I was really interested in doing a project that would let me combine the data skills that I have learned in addition to, um, you know, using the 
area studies knowledge and language skills that I've gained. So those are the two major reasons why I chose the project. I mean, it's really a great example of how you can combine both area knowledge, but also methodological skills and, you know, theoretical knowledge and asking really important real world questions to this program. And I should also note that you know, University of Michigan's got one of the best schools of public health in the country. And so I think anyone who's thinking about, you know, kind of who wants to work, you know, in that kind of area, uh, you know, not necessarily for happy reasons, but I think uh, public health is going to remain a really enormous area of, you know, government funding and research and employment opportunities in the years to come. So I think it's really great to take opportunity of, you know, things through the MIRS program, look at the School of Public Health, check out the, the course offerings there and the advisors there as well, among other, among other departments. Anybody else have a question for Amanda? I guess I, I could ask one more, which I was sort of, you know, sparked by, by Ahmad's question about polarization. You know, we had a, a postdoc here at the International Institute a few years ago named Natalia Forat, who did some amazing both ethnographic and quantitative research on um, sort of different levels of trust in Russia toward the state. And what she really showed in, in an impressive way is that it really varies across the country. And there are parts of the country where levels of trust in the state are extremely high. And there are levels where there's a lot of skepticism about everything the government does. And so even if it doesn't take the form of polarization, like as Ahmad said, or like as we see in the United States, clearly you know, partisanship and there's polarization over the vaccine, but there could still be you know, serious divides within the country, even if it's not taking on political form. And so I was sort of wondering, is there any way that we, that we can know from the research you've done if there's like, if there's diversity, you know, do we have a sense of what kind of people, where they are, anything about their, um, you know, anything about their their covariates, if you will, that make them more or less likely to to be vaccine hesitant? Yeah, um, that was something that I really wanted to do, but unfortunately, I was not able to like. So the the API that I used only returned. Um, the post and the date and the URL. Um, it didn't let me capture any demographic information. Um, that is something that I would like to explore if I were to do this research project again, if I or if I were to expand on it. Um, that would definitely a be a priority area. But no, unfortunately, I don't have any demographic data right now. Yeah, and well, this is a good example of why people do amazing research projects at the MA level and then often go and get a PhD. Because even when you do an amazing research project, there's always more research to be done. So this really sets the stage for a lot of more interesting questions. So but what a fabulous, timely project. So Amanda, thanks for taking the time to present it to us. Um, I'm going to move on to our second presenter now. Um, but we should all give it a, an extra little reaction clap like that, I think. Don't you think, for Amanda? I think everybody should. It would be it would be a deafening applause. It would be such a roar if it were, if we were all in person. You know, it's it's you know just imagine, just imagine, imagine the big house, the football stadium in Michigan built. So, moving on. So our second presentation is from Karen Weldon. Karen is a dual degree student pursuing the Japanese studies specialization within MIRS and a master's in environment and sustainability. Throughout her time at Michigan, Karen has received several awards, including a FOSS, FOSS fellowship, the Dr. Hiroyuki and Mrs. Helen Reinhardt Iwete Fellowship and a Center for Japanese Studies Alumni Fellowship. She was also recognized with the Edward Seiden Sticker Award for Best Japan Paper at the University of Hawaii's 2021 Asian Studies Graduate Student Conference, which was sadly probably not in person. I mean, to have to go to a conference at Hawaii but not be in person seems like cruel and unusual punishment. Her academic interests include environmental and agricultural ethics, as well as policies and social movements in contemporary Japan. So please join me in welcoming Karen to present her talk titled Japonic Fields, Cultivating National Identity in Small Town Japan. Thank you so much for that introduction. I'm really excited to be here today and tell everyone a little bit about what I've been working on um, during my time in the MIRS program. I ho also hope this presentation is an opportunity for um, folks who are interested in the program to sort of see how to leverage the resources here at the University of Michigan. Um, next slide, please. Um, so my master's thesis, which I will not delve into in great detail today, um, focuses on how sustainable agriculture is being used to uplift struggling rural communities. And so this is sort of like a wide ranging um, focus that includes thinking about what the benefits to society are of sustainable agriculture, how it's impacting the local economy and the environment at large. Um, today's presentation will focus sort of like on a little bit of research that sort of took my interest in a different direction um, through the researching this topic. Next, please. 
So one of the farming methods that I've been studying for my thesis is a farming method called natural cultivation, or Shizen Saibai in Japanese. This was started in the 1980s by an apple farmer who gained fame through the TV show The Miracle Apple. You can see him smiling up there in the top right corner. Um, and um, the kind of the key tenets of this farming philosophy and practice are it doesn't use any agrochemicals. Um, so no pesticides, no fertilizers, um, and also no animal byproducts, for example, like manure, which is really common in more sustainable farming practices. On the right, there are some shriveled up vegetables, and that's sort of a fun fact about natural cultivation. The practitioners and proponents of the method often say that the vegetables grown through this method do not rot. They shrivel up and dry up like the picture there. Um, so this past summer, I had a chance to do some research in Japan on this natural cultivation method. Next slide, please. So um, thanks to generous funding through the Center for Japanese Studies, they offer support for folks who want to do international study, um, international research. Um, I think all the centers do. So it's a great opportunity for all those mirrors, mirrors folks. Um, I got to go to Ishikawa, Japan and look at a community that was really um, focusing on supporting this natural cultivation method. They've dubbed themselves the Mecca of natural cultivation um, and a little bit of context about Hakui. Like many towns and cities in Japan and rural areas, they're facing depopulation. Young people are going to cities where there are more opportunities and in a society where there's a large aging population, a lot of the elderly are being left um, in rural communities. Moreover, there's a pretty strong um, farming heritage in the area, but they're experiencing lots of farmland abandonment as young people leave and older people are no longer able to, uh, older farmers are no longer able to take care of the land. So in Hakui, there's a really unique program that's being run by the city in collaboration with the Japanese Agricultural Cooperative, or JA for short. Um, JA is a huge national organization, a cooperative of farmers that really supports farmers in a variety of ways, providing technical support, um, selling machinery, and also sort of being the clearinghouse for major agricultural products like rice. Um, Typically, they support conventional agriculture, but in this key instance, um, in the city of Hakui, um, they're doing um, work to support natural cultivation. Um, and this involves extensive su infrastructure support, like rice processing facilities, a machine sharing program, and courses on how to farm through natural cultivation. Um, next, please. So taking a step to back to the United States and back to Michigan, um, last semester I had an opportunity to take this great course, Critical Introduction to Asian Studies. I recommend it to um, those of you who are in the room who study Asia. Um, it gave me some really great tools to sort of think about how to analyze and conceptualize some of the things I've been noticing in the field. Um, next slide, please. So. One of the key focuses of that course was thinking about how nationhood was portrayed um, in different contexts. Um, we started out with sort of a landmark text, Benedict Anderson's Imagined Communities. Um, so in this work, Anderson argues that a na nation has been formed through, or the definition of a na nation is a imagined political community. And he leads his argument through 16th century um, European history, explaining how the rise of vernaculars and then the spread of vernaculars through the printing press really led to a sense of people feeling a shared sense of camaraderie, a national identity. So um, Anderson sort of opened the bucket to a lot of different theorists to sort of describe and build on these texts. Um, one theorist that I found particularly influ influential was the Thai scholar, Tong Chai Uni Chakal. I'm sorry, I probably butchered that. I've been practicing this morning, but probably I'm still getting it wrong. Um, but his work um, is on Siam mapped, was really influential in sort of conceptualizing what I was seeing in Japan. So some amendments that he makes to Anderson's work is he first, he identifies this negative identification of nationhood. So while Anderson really focuses on shared commonality between people within a nation, um, Winning Chakal explains that there's actually another component, an us versus them, people who share the same things that we do that can be compared to those who are different from us. Another key amendment that he makes to Anderson's um, theory is this idea that vernaculars are part of a larger, um, I don't know, category of tools, um, what he calls mediators or ways that we um, engage with the outside world. And because there are more mediators, there are other ways to create imagined communities. And so this idea was really influential in me thinking about what I was seeing um, regarding natural cultivation in the city of Hakui. Next, please. 
So today I'd like to argue that for struggling rural communities in Japan, a farming method can be conceived as a mediator for national identity, a, a way to revitalize the community and assert the community's relevance on the national and international stage. Next, please. So um, I'll be getting a little bit more into how Hakui's natural cultivation was portrayed. So I had an opportunity to speak with one of the founders of the natural cultivation movement in Hakui. Um, and one of the key things, the key ways that he described um, natural cultivation was that it was Japonic. That was one of the first words that he explained to me. Um, and then he went on to sort of describe what that meant. Um, so he explained, looking back in history, how current agrochemical intensive farming comes from the West. It is what he called Cartesian farming, um, this idea that it was based on dualisms of having to have inputs and then outputs um, or, or harvests. And that in Japan, farming was different before Western contact. Um, Japanese people didn't have this sort of dualism that was sort of um, key to the chemical farming, chemical based farming that is widespread today in Japan as well. Um, and recently, the only people he's been seeing um, sort of on the global on the global scale of, of um, people who have been pushing back against this Cartesian farming have been Japanese farmers, farmers that say that you don't need any inputs at all. And while there have been sort of sustainable farming movements um, across the world, for him, it was really this Japanese people that were so focusing on um, this idea of zero inputs. So um, in Hakui, this idea of Japonic farming has been leveraged to make the city nationally relevant. It's the only mecca of Japonic farming in the nation. And because of such, um, such recognition or such titles, it has been able to attract visitors who are interested in learning about this method and new residents. Um, I got to interview many farmers who had come from Tokyo and across the nation to decide to take up natural farming as they're calling. Uh, moreover, um, thanks to this Japonic farming um, title, the city is able to claim its international importance. Um, so the area that Hakui is located in is designated as a UN globally important agricultural heritage system. And this involves Hakui in a number of other cities. But talking to the leader who um, dubbed this, the, the, the farming method as Japonic, um, the reason why this region has been designated as this for this um, national heritage as a globally important agricultural heritage system is because of the Japonic farming there. Um, sort of more concretely, um, whether that's true or not is up for bit debate, but um, more, more concretely, um, thanks to this designation, there has been lots more international exchange um, in Hakui. So there have been chefs who've been interested in learning how to cook with um, natural cultivation um, farmed products. Um, I think there's also exports um, that are happening, um, sending rice produced in Hakui to be um, sold in natural food stores in California. Next, please. So a few takeaways from um, this work, um, a farming philosophy can be a mediator for a real community's identity, bringing people together um, around a shared sense of identity. Um, and using, um, using this mediator and you're using this idea of Japonic farming, um, Hakui is able to try to resurrect its farming heritage or at least attempt to resurrect its farming heritage um, and sort of support its community. And then in the process is becoming both a national and global model for sustainability. Thank you. Next, please. So thank you all for listening um, to this lightning presentation, or as I would end most presentations in Japan, gosecho arigato gozaimashita. Fantastic. And, and once again, this is, you know, staying on time is no small thing. You know, the people who've been doing this a lot longer than these students have a very hard time presenting their research in just 10 minutes. So uh, it really, really shows the ability to be, you know, have brevity as well as thoroughness in terms of the uh, coverage of these, again, these really terrific research projects. Do we have uh, another five minute Q&A session? Do we have any, uh, any questions for, for Karen on her research? Mara. Sure. Um, so what made you interested in this like type of uh, Japonic farming? Because I'm going to be honest, I've never heard of it, but it sounds extremely interesting. And um, that especially regarding like cultural uh, regards in order to like what you input, what you get out. And, and so what made you interested? Um, yeah, so 
I guess I had lived in Japan before um, coming to Mears and had been interested in agriculture at that time. And I'd heard about natural cultivation, um, but not really investigated it more fully. Um, and so when this opportunity to do research in Japan arose, I thought this is a great opportunity to learn more about this um, cultivation technique. Um, sorry, your, your questions cut out a little bit, but hopefully that's, that's the gist of it there. If there's any more specifics, feel free to follow up. Great. Any other questions for Karen? I mean, it's really interesting, right? There's so much discussion about, you know, urban, rural polarization these days. Come back to polarization again, right? And this idea that with rural decline, there's just so little like political progressivism, you know, in the in the countryside. So it's kind of striking to see, it would kind of be nice to see if in other areas that rather than just be areas of kind of decline with the global economy, to see this kind of creativity, sort of a kind of national confidence, if you will, you know? So it's more of a comment than a question, but it was something that struck me when listening. Azumi. So Karen, I want to ask you kind of a um, more of a logistics question um, because obviously it's uh, uh, it, you know I know as a fellows grants coordinator that it's not exactly easy to um, you know secure enough uh, resources in terms of funding and whatnot um, to you know, pull off a summer research trip to Japan. So how did you do it? <laughs> Thanks, Anne, um, for that question. We worked closely on this, I think, when I was applying actually for grants. Um, so yeah, so CJS has this summer funding fellowship. Um, and so I applied for that and that was $5,000 um, Rackham. The graduate school also is able to support students in, um, in funding their research. So I applied for that and was able to receive that grant as well. Um, I'm in a very lucky situation in that um, I have a place to stay in Japan. So I was able to offset a lot of the housing costs um, by paying pretty minimally um, thanks to relatives um, um, places to stay. So that sort of cut down on costs. There are, but there are numerous grants through the university. I think there's an international travel grant of $10,000. Um, although Anne would probably know better than I do about that, um, that can really support students in embarking on international research. Great, terrific question. Any other questions for Karen? Before we move on to our third lightning speaker. Lightning doesn't just strike twice around here, it strikes four times. So let's go to our, let's go to our third. And so, oh, again, sorry, applause, please. This is not Jeb Bush saying, please clap. This is me saying amazing research. I'm sure everyone, everyone who's listening agrees. It's really impressive to see what, and see what you can do in just a relatively short program too, you know? And this is, you know, you think these are projects that people are writing PhDs for five or six years, but these are the kind of things you can do in a, you know, in a relatively short program in the, at Mears. Okay, so our third speaker is gonna be Ernesta Cole. Uh, Ernesta is a first year student in the African Studies Specialization of the Mears program. She has received the South African Initiatives Office Fellowship through the Department of Afro-American and African Studies. Her research interests focus on the sociolinguistics of Creole languages, which she intends to continue studying at the doctoral level after completing MIRS. Please join me in welcoming Ernesta for her talk titled Indigenous Languages and the Written Expression in Sierra Leone, a Comparison with English. Hi, everyone. Um, before I get started, I just want to say thank you to Tina and Charlie for putting together uh, this lightning graduating talk. Glad graduate lightning talk and allowing me to share my research today. I'm excited to be here as um, the only first year MIRA student and I'm looking forward to getting feedback from the audience. Um, like Dan said, my title is Indigenous Languages and the Written Expression in Sierra Leone, a Comparison with English. Um, next slide, please. So yes, a little bit of background about me and my work. Um, my name is Renasta Cole. I'm in the African um, Studies Specialization. Um, and my research is, in, is focused on sociolinguistics, which is the study of languages in relation to social factors like class, gender, bilingualism, et cetera, as well as diglossia, which is a situation in which two languages are used under different conditions within the same community. Um, and as my title says, my work is in Sierra Leone in West Africa, and it's currently focused on the Creole language, which I'm a native speaker of. Um, and I hope to expand this research throughout Sierra Leone as well as other West African countries. And I'll talk about more about that later. Um, next slide. Um, I have two research questions. The first being how important are native languages like Creole to natives of Sierra Leone in comparison to English, 
which is the native language, which is the official language, sorry. And um, a fun fact about Sierra Leone there is that there are 22 other languages, um, including Mende, Timi, and Limba. Um, my second research question is how does this linguistic discrepancy affect the written expression of these languages? So to understand, to, ask, to answer these questions, we need to first know what the linguistic discrepancies are. Um, next slide. My research focuses on three of them. The first being colonization. So Sierra Leone was colonized by the British and it gained its independence in 1961. And one of the laws that the British enforced was the banning of native languages in schools. So this obviously has um, an impact on written expression. Um, the second discrepancy is that Creole has a limited orthography. Um, orthography is the conventional spelling system of a language and the Creole orthography borrows English language English letters and combines them with Creole sounds because Creole does not have its own standardized alphabet. So for example, the word car in English is motoka in Creole, but um, a native speaker could spell that as M-O-T-O-C-A and another um, native speaker of Creole could spell that as M-O-T, possibly another T-K-A. Um, so this puts Creole at an advantage over the other native languages that have zero orthographies at all, but also at a disadvantage with English. And the third um, discrepancy is the dichotomy between unofficial and official um, languages. People that speak the official languages are placed at a higher setting of mainstream culture, education, law, business, etc. And those who don't speak it are left out. Um, next slide. So this discrepancy between unofficial and official um, leads to feelings of inadequacy that I intend to challenge and works, work towards reformulating in order to promote their value and advocate for recognition and respect um, for users of those languages. And so in order to do this, I have two methods. Next slide, please. The first is archival research um, in detail on British colonial rule that impacted academia. I can do this in the British Council Library as well as the USCIS, also known as the American Library, both in Sierra Leone. Um, I can also do research um, in the United States at the Library of Congress in the Africa Room, as well as the Sierra Leonean Embassy. Um, and these are both located in Washington, DC. And my second um, method would be field-based research, where I would conduct surveys and interviews with students, professors, administrators, um, anyone with a stake in education about written expression in Sierra Leone. Um, I would do this at four public universities there and two private ones as well. Uh, next slide, please. So some long-term goals. My first is to um, continue my research in the PhD program, either in sociolinguistics or linguistic anthropology. I'm also open to any other field that supports my research. Um, my second goal is to disseminate my results locally and internationally um, through various mediums. And my third main goal um, is to provide the impetus for more texts to be published in Creo and used in higher education in Sierra Leone. Um, and then lastly, like I touched on earlier, I hope to expand this um, research from Creo to the other native to the other native languages in Sierra Leone, like Mende, Timni, and Limba. And then also furthermore expanding it outside of Sierra Leone. Um, I hope to do this research in the Gambia, which has a, a language very similar to Creole called Aku. Uh, next slide. So yes, this brings me to the end of my presentation. Um, thank you all for listening. Okay, thank you, Ernesta. Fantastic. Um, and before we start Q&A, I should just, you know, one programmatic note. If, if you've listened to the first three presentations and you're all feeling insecure about your language skills, because it's so impressive, <laughs> the kind of language skills that these three students have come to the program with, um, rest assured, Michigan's an amazing place to get language training. And so no one should feel too intimidated or concerned if others are a bit ahead of them. Um, you know, being able to devote yourself to improving your language skills is one of the main reasons to do the program, frankly. So... Um, fantastic work, in Ernesta. Um, five minutes. Does anyone have any questions for Ernesta on her research? Maimuna. Um, yeah. Um, I just want to say that this is a great presentation and something that I can relate to being a French speaker, but also like 
realizing that native languages in West Africa are sometimes forgotten even. Um, and I was just wondering, in terms of the field study, um, how important is it for you to kind of go to Sierra Leone and speak to the native speakers there? Um, and really, how do you think that will pivot your research forward in comparison to kind of maybe doing it over Zoom or um, just doing archival studies? Yeah, um, I think being there in person and asking um, people face to face is, is very important, um, especially because I want my research to be directly from the mouths of Sierra Leoneans, um, since this project is about them and benefiting um, the education system there. Um, I mean, if it's, I hope to go there this summer to do research. I've applied for some funding. We'll see how that turns out. Um, and if it's not possible, <laughs> yes, if it's not possible, I mean, online options are all, always there. Um, surveys, um, Zoom interviews like this. Um, so yeah, I, I'd love to do it in person, but if not, there's the virtual option and then as archival research as well. Thank you. Yeah, it's really been amazing to see the last few years how much actual field research and you know just great international research people have been able to do despite despite COVID, despite travel restrictions. And so hopefully in the next few years, um, things will be loosened up at least a little bit and you'll all have a, you know, much bigger opportunities and not have the same kind of barriers that our, that our current cohorts have, have faced and really, I think, heroically overcome. Any other questions for Ernesta? Uh, yes, uh, Yinger. Uh, hi, thank you for your wonderful presentation. Um, and I'm very impressed. So um, I'm a little bit curious about your methods in your field-based research. So um, um, I want to know to what degree you want to assess and answer your research question. So will you go to a more uh, micro level and apply some linguistic or research methods such as conversational analysis or look at the phonetic aspects, or you would like to go to a more macro level, like uh, ask people how do they feel when they use those two kinds of languages? That's a great question. Um, yeah. Currently, I'm, my research is more focused on sociocultural um, aspects mm -hmm. of things rather than the linguistic details. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, like you said, I'd be asking people how they feel about these, like what each language places them in society um, and in mm -hmm. academics. Um, I haven't done this research yet, yet, obviously, but I'm hoping my, whatever questions I come up with that the responses are open. You know, any, any data is good data. Whatever people are willing to share about mm -hmm. how they feel about this is some stuff, is stuff that I'm uh, eager to collect. Yeah, because I know some research, they would like to uh, analyze the syntax or something very structural uh, aspects of languages. So I'm curious what aspect you focus on. And thank you for the answer. Yeah, so I mean, just to kind of expand currently sociocultural, but as I go on, I could um, focus more on the linguistics and um, especially uh, with Creole making efforts to standardize the alphabet and things like that. Yeah, and good luck to your research. <laughs> Terrific, thanks for those questions. Uh, any other questions for Ernesta? Yes, Mamuna again. Uh, really quickly, I was just wondering, um, I remember you saying that you wanna uh, focus on Gambia next. Um, and I was wondering, did you want to do a comparative analysis or are you going to kind of just like focus strictly on Gambia and like strictly on Sierra Leone or compare them? Um, I think I would do um, strictly Sierra Leone and then next like strictly Gambia. Um, there is, this is such a big topic. I mean, I could focus on, I could like continue my focus on um, Creoles globally, you know, there's Haitian Creole, there's Jamaican Creole, um, and then there's also pigeons of West Africa. So there's really an endless amount of content here. Yes, exactly. So as saying before, you do these big research projects and what it shows you is there's still a lot more to be done. <laughs> and 
you know, hopefully if you feel energized by what you do and you want to keep working on it. Um, that's what happens for a lot of us when we do our master's degrees. Um, and other of us can't wait to go work in the private sector or do something else. So there's a lot of flexibility and a lot of options. So thank you, Ernesta, another fantastic uh, presentation. So please join me in applauding for Ernesta, the roar of the crowd yet again. Okay, and so now we've got to our, our fourth and final speaker of uh, the afternoon, and this will be uh, Shushuan Wang. Uh, Shushuan is a second year student in MIRS with a Chinese study specialization, uh, and she will graduate this April. Her research interests include Chinese labor law and its implementation, current labor unrest, and the feminist movement in contemporary China. She's also interested in the overlapping duties and functions of the All China Federation of Trade Unions and the All China Women's Federation. In her time at Michigan, she has twice been awarded the Lieberthal Robel Endowment Fellowship and has been named a James B. Angel Scholar as of 2021. So please join me in welcoming Shishuan to present her talk, which is titled Research and Translation for the China Law and Society Review, Special Edition. All right. Thank you so much for Dan for your introduction. And a big thanks to Charlie and Tina for organizing this amazing event. And I think that I might be the only one who conduct practi uh, practicum course instead of the MA thesis in four of the presenters for today's event. So uh, I want to mention that my topic, research and the translation for China law and society review special edition is more like a, a working experience instead of like the whole uh, researching experience. And my advisor is Professor Mary Gallagher, who is also an expert in Chinese labor politics. Right, next slide, please. Uh, so before I started, I want to introduce a very brief uh, capstone project timeline. Uh, so in fall 2020, I started to work as an RA for Professor Gallagher to conduct labor, con uh, labor contract law related research. And one interesting report is to uh, con construct a research for the anti-996 movement and other labor dispute cases. And in spring and summer 2021, I started to translate two pieces of journal articles from well-known uh, Chinese labor law scholars. One is Professor Dong Baohua and another one is uh, Professor Chang Kai. And in fall 2021, uh, I started the background uh, research and translations of the annotations, uh, as well as checking on the references and sources. And we have arranged meetings with authors to also clarify some specific terms and definitions. And in winter 2022, I enrolled in practicum course and conduct the work reports, which can finally make me to finish the capstone and graduate. Oh, next slide, please. So the first article I translated is by Professor Dong Baohua, and it's called Conflict of Ideas and Institutional Adjustments of Labor Contract Law. So Professor Dong Baohua mentioned about in his article, the primary contra uh, contradiction in current labor contract law, as well as in uh, labor law related issues is this kind of pull and push between the employer aut autonomy and state intervention. And he wants to show this relationship, a relationship between the two, uh, two, uh, two, of, two of the powers and trying to show them through the correlations between the labor dispute cases and the uh, Chinese, GDP, uh, Chinese GDP growth. Next, please. And here, because like, his research, his topic is too sophisticated and it in really included a lot of elements. Here, I will just introduce one of the elements that I feel most interested in. So in China, uh, the current labor contract law ac actually applied this unilateral protection principle in their legislature. Unilater unilateral protection means that you only protect workers and trying to help them to protect their own interests and rights. So when there is an economic downturn or economic crisis, individual workers feel that their, their rights and their interests got infringement. Uh, they will seek to, uh, seek to the state and seeking for the state intervention and state will force employers to make compensations. 
But sometimes if the economic, uh, economy is really bad, employers actually cannot pay a lot for individual workers. So there will be a lot of uh, labor dispute cases. But you, you can still see on the left hand, it's a very stable triangle structure, or which is also the legis legislature and Chinese state trying to pursue it's a very, uh, they, they want the stability instead of the flexibility in the market. But Professor Dong Baohua actually mentioned it's really important to kind of uh, de deconstruct this triangle and to ask the employers and individual workers to construct labor contracts and negotiate through labor contracts about their rights and interests in a relatively equal position. And uh, on this, uh, on the, on the, in, in this perspective, state can also provide protection, but not only to workers, uh, but also to the employers. Uh, but they will protect, uh, protect workers more because workers, they are kind of vulnerable groups. And that this kind of bilateral protection is very famous. And in, in English, it's also called it pro, pro labor protection. Uh, Professor Dong Baohua considered this as a revision goal for the current labor law contract, labor contract law, sorry about that. Uh, and I think that is quite interesting and it's a foundation of his a uh, whole article. Next slide, please. And here we can move to Professor Chang Kai's article. The name is China's Transitions to Collective Relations. If Professor Dong Baohua's uh, topic is more about individ uh, individual relations, the collective relations is also important for Professor Chang Kai. So he mentioned in current China, we have these two forces and two roles. So first is the top-down method from uh, our China Federation of Trade Union, ACFTU, trying to apply, uh, apply trade union worker, uh, trade union work to grassroots workers, which means there are some policies and enforcement and they want workers to uh, follow and in order to protect their rights. But also you can see the uh, grassroots workers, they organize the labor movement and trying to show the ACFTU what they really want. So for Professor Chang Kai, it's really important to make the two forces to cooperate with each other instead of uh, to separate from each other. But it's important for the ACF, ACFTU to recognize and to give, leg uh, give legitimacy of the labor movement. Because in China, like all, all enterprises unions have to follow ACFTU through. Uh, next, please. Uh, so here is just uh, an example. And uh, Professor Chang Kai mentioned about the labor movement is the ultimate motive to transfer individual relations to collect collective relations. So he believes that 2010 strike, uh, strike wave is actually the milestone because starting from that point, workers actually have this rational and collective bargaining with the employers. So before that, it's kind of like non-collective consciousness. So it's really interesting. And during here, you can see workers' self-consciousness also transferred from their the leading class uh, consciousness during plan, a planned economy to workers as hired labor consciousness uh, in the uh, market-oriented uh, economy. Next, please. And it's also important to actually under, understand ACFTU's position. It's actually just a political organization, but uh, so, some of uh, its very important role is also to protect uh, workers, especially after the 2010 work uh, strike wave. Strike wave. Uh, but there are definitely some disadvantage and advantage for it. So I encourage you, if you want to know more, to read the Professor Chang Kai's article. Next, please. So uh, for me, as a translator and research myself, I just found there are some challenges and difficulties. First is to understand who are the target audiences. So uh, it's apparently when I translated to the English, there for the English speaking and English reading uh, uh, readers. 
And another thing is that like some of one of the article is too professional and too sophisticated. I just wonder how can it get more audiences because you want to really uh, jump out and skip out this ivory tower of academia. And uh, there are definitely like some different terms and systems about labor law and trade union system between China and the foreign countries, especially capitalist countries. So uh, I have to kind of like coordinate between this uh, between these differences and to understand how to translate it to make readers to understand. Next, please. And for me, there are definitely some future uh, research questions. One important thing for me is trying to understand and to make this comparative research and analysis of All China Federation of Trade Unions and All China Women's Federation, because they clearly are state organ political organizations. And I really want to know how the differences and the similarities make them going on in the current market oriented economy. Next, please. Uh, here is just a very uh, brief uh, is process of my topic selection. I just want to the prospective mere student know that I actually started with a very like different topics, but I changed a lot during my MIRS program. And I really appreciate it. MIRS program can actually provide this flexible arrangement for me to help me to understand what I really want to, uh, want to search in my future. And next, please. Uh, yeah, that would be it. Thank you all for listening. Okay, thank you, Chishuan. Um, so I think a couple of themes there that are really interesting. One is she said the flexibility to be able to move around, try different topics, you know, be flexible and get a lot of support for a lot of a lot of um, different projects here. But also, you know, I mean, I'm glad we have someone doing the, the capstone project, the the practicum, um, and raising this issue of the differences between you know kind of academic audiences, policy audiences, and the like, because. Um, those of you who were part of the session yesterday heard me say that I think that you know we can overstate the extent to which these tracks are really really different. Um, I think what you do at Mears is, you know, and in, in graduate school is you learn to ask good questions. You learn learn to you know state your arguments in a concise way, which all four of our presenters have done masterfully today. Um, and you learn how to sort of project these ideas, you know, in a way that that should resonate, not just, you know, within academic audiences, but also outside. So hopefully people won't feel too much like they're, you know, tracked one way or the other, or feel like they have to make some kind of hard choice between the two. Um, so Chushuan, really important topic, uh, labor in China. Anybody have any questions for, uh, for her? Mamuna, please. Uh, great presentation. Uh, I Thank love you. the topic. Uh, I was just wondering, did you find that your courses that you chose in the MIRS program helped you kind of navigate and change um, the subject that you wanted to study? Or was it maybe conversations with your cohort or professors? Like what really made you have like those shifts? Uh, I think my advisor, Professor Mara Gallagher, definitely like su supported me a lot. And in MIRS, I actually took a lot of classes that uh, have the Chinese topic. And I think they are just really helpful because uh, MIRS is kind of interdisciplinary uh, program. So you can definitely uh, enroll in class uh, more theor theoretically, but also on the other hand, like you can construct kind of uh, like more ethnographic research in some other uh, classes, but you can also see there's kind of like archive, uh, archive records that you, you want to learn. And I think the diversity in this, in these classes are just to help me to, to navigate what I really want to learn. Because I think my first topic, I actually want, wanted to do the MA thesis in contemporary Chinese feminism. But sadly, uh, the mentor I want to follow, uh, she, she, she got retired in the first semester. So I have, ha have to actually change it. And also because of the COVID-19 stuff and I, I, 
as an international student, I also have I also have to experience the difficulties of the visa. So there are just like so many factors made me have to change to change the topics. But I still think I am really passionate about the current topics I'm doing, and I really love it because like starting from the uh, even before starting from the uh, starting the RA, I actually have zero experience in Chinese labor law. So I think it's just a process of learning and it's important. Thank you. Yeah, it's a great example of how, of the role of the center mentors play and that your advisors can play in sort of helping you find a, you know, a project that's doable, that's going to be meaningful to you and you know, it's not just about taking, you know, when you're an undergrad, it's a lot more about taking classes and then you learn whatever you learn from classes and then the class is over. Um, and in a master's program, there's a lot more ongoing sustained contact with, um, you know, with your, with the faculty uh, in a way that's going to really, really help you, you know, come together with your, your final project and then figure out what you want to do next after the program as well. Yeah. Do we have any more, uh, more questions for Chishuan? Okay. Well, it's really great. I mean, this so that concludes our four presentations for today, all of which were, I think, really, really fantastic. Let's all give another round of applause first for Chu Xuan, number one, um, and then we're going to thank everybody as well. Um, so, thanks everybody for uh, for joining today um, on these graduate student lightning talks. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed learning about the interesting work that our students have been undertaking. Um, it's always amazing, I think, to hear how bright and accomplished they are. So many thanks again to each of the speakers for sharing their own experiences. Um, one last virtual round of applause if, you're, if your ears can take the, can take the noise one more time. Um, all right, it's like being at a rock concert. Um, so thanks again, this will conclude our event. Um, so visiting students, I know there may be a few more items on your itineraries. And if so, I hope you enjoy the rest of your virtual visit. Um, definitely let us know if you have any questions and otherwise, have a wonderful weekend. But last but not least, uh, thanks so much to Charlie and Tina for doing everything that, that they've done to put together this event and then all the events with, uh, with the virtual uh, recruitment visit. They always do amazing work. And if you come to Michigan, you'll see they keep doing this kind of amazing work all the time and they're always here for you. So it's really a, a really, really well-run program um, by, by them. And so thanks to them and thanks everybody for attending and hope everyone, uh, everyone stays safe, stays healthy and hope to see a lot of you in Michigan in the fall. So take care all.